hi there. I just wanted to pop in to say hey and, um, and to say that I've been watching the Hay House World Summit, which is going on right now, and it's been fabulous. I've been, um, I've, I've been watching some of the authors and all that are on it, and today I, was, I tuned in to um, I tune into Cheryl Richardson, Anthony Williams, and a couple of others. So I hope you've been catching the Hay House World Summit as well. So anyway, my interview is on it as well. So I would love for you to check it out if you can. Mine is called um, Living Heaven in a Fear-Based World or in a Fear-Based Culture. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about my interview. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Anita Murjani, and um, I, you know, just a little bit about my background story. Wayne Dyer was the one who discovered my story and asked me to publish a book and have it, uh, and asked Hay House to publish it. And if it wasn't for Wayne Dyer, I wouldn't be here today speaking to you doing what I'm doing. But uh, technically, if the doctors were right, I wouldn't be here at all. Technically, I should have been dead. Um, I should have died on February the 2nd, 2006. Um, I had cancer for four years, and I had lymphoma that spread throughout my body until I reached end stage. It was final stages of cancer where I had tumors, some of them the size of golf balls, uh, that spread all over my body, and my organs shut down, and I was supposed to die. I went into a coma. The doctors said these were my final hours. But I entered what I call another realm or, um, yeah, another realm or another state where I understood what caused the cancer. And I had written about my story on a, on a website, which Wayne Dyer discovered. But when I discovered, when I was in this other state, um, I also met my deceased dad, my deceased father who had died 10 years prior, and I was told that it wasn't my time to die, that I needed to go back. Now, no part of me wanted to come back into this physical body, but I was led to understand that heaven is a state. It's a state of being. It's not a place, because I was feeling incredible in that realm. Um, I was feeling so loved and all the fear and the pain from all those years of having the cancer and the, the fear of the cancer, the fear of the treatment, the fear of death, the pain, the discomfort, all of it was gone when I was in that state. So no part of me wanted to come back. But then I was led to understand that everything I was feeling there is a state of being, that heaven is a state of being, it's not a place. And I realized that even if I came back, I could recreate that state here. So I decided to come back into my physical body and the cancer healed. And the challenge has been in recreating that state here. And so hence um, the interview on um, that I've done, which is together with Greg Sherwood, who is the one who interviewed me, he asked me some great questions. So if you check it out on, um, on this week's Hay House World Summit, um, you'll see that I'll be speaking a little bit about what brought me back from the other side and also um, how to create that heaven here. See, and also, by the way, I would love for people, those of you who tuned in, to ask me questions. Ask me absolutely anything at all you want about my, uh, about my story, about my experience, anything you want. So I don't, um, I don't mind at all. And I see that somebody has written, what if this is hell? Bren Rona Norris. Okay, I don't blame you for saying that because originally, so my, my second book, my first book was called Dying to Be Me, which is the story about me dying. My second book, which is about living life after coming back, is called What If This Is Heaven? And a lot of people have said to me, but what if this is hell? And so originally the title I had for the book was What If This Is Heaven? And why does it feel like hell? But I was advised not to put hell in the title. And I don't blame you for feeling that way. And the reason it feels like hell, and this is my point, the reason it feels like hell is because we live in a fear-based culture where we are brought up on a diet of fear. One of the things that I realized in the other realm is that 
um, is that only love is real. Only love exists. And I realized that everything that we have been brought up to believe, everything that we have learned in this physical life, everything we've been conditioned to believe is actually the opposite of what we need to know or what we need to believe in order to live um, a love-based life that works for us, in order to live a happy, healthy, productive life. And so, for example, to give you an example, is that our education system is fear-based. It's based on the fear of failing, and that's what drives us, instead of a desire for learning. We, the desire for learning is not instilled in us. Instead, what's instilled in us is the fear of failing. Um, as a result, we grow up fearing shame, fearing failure, because we fear that we're going to come last and we fear being shamed. As we grow up, we fear um, being left behind. We fear not being good enough. We fear disappointing other people. We fear being shamed. Um, even when it comes to illnesses, we fear illness. We don't embrace good health. We fear illness. Our whole healthcare system is based on illness fear as opposed to health care. I call it an illness scare system, not a health care system. So our health care system is so focused on looking for illness. It's not focused on helping us get well. It's focused on looking for illness and then attacking that illness. So each and every one of us, when we go see a doctor or we go to hospital for tests, we go in not with the view of embracing our life and our health and thinking, okay, we need to do this to get well because I love my life. No, we go in to the test thinking, oh my God, they're going to look for illnesses. I hope they don't find anything. It's all fear-based. And this is the problem. Fear is what erodes us. It chips away at us this fear of not being good enough, this fear of illness. Even when we think we're eating so-called healthy foods, we're not doing it because we love our lives and because we want to live long and we have a passion for living and therefore we want to be healthy. No, we do it because we fear illness. And I say this not as a judgment to you or to anybody listening in. I say this because that's how I was as well. It took death for me to learn that in fact this fear is an invitation for us to love more. And the only way to transcend the fear is to love more. That's the only way. You can't get rid of fear by focusing on fear. You can't get rid of fear by saying, oh my gosh, I'm fearing too much. How do I get rid of it? No, because you, all that'll happen is that you'll start fearing the fear. Every time you feel the fear, you're going to fear it. You're going to say, oh, I'm not supposed to fear, but I'm fearing. I'm feeling fear. What do I do? You're going to fear every time you, you feel fear. The only way to transcend fear is to increase love. The opposite of fear is love. So you have to turn up the love. How do you turn up the love? You turn up the love first by loving yourself. How do you love yourself? So first of all, those of you who don't love yourself, um, if you don't love yourself, there are a lot of symptoms. If you don't love yourself, you tend to put yourself last, put yourself down, criticize yourself. Um, you're not good at receiving. You're not good at saying no. You treat yourself like a doormat. You're a people pleaser. I know this because that's who I was. Um, I was exactly that. So in order to love yourself, you really have to start to think, how can I love myself more? What brings me joy? You have to ask yourself questions like, what brings me joy? If I could do anything I want, what would I do? You have to start learning to say no to anything that is not you or to say no to doing things that you don't want to do, but you're doing them because you're afraid of displeasing people. That's really um, one definite way to love yourself. And so many of us, so many of us who are attracted to this work, who are attracted to self-help and <clears throat> attracted to spiritual teachings, we're terrible at loving ourselves. We're terrible at saying no. And please tell me in the comments if you agree with it. Um, 
So if you agree with what I'm saying or if you relate to what I'm saying, and we're all, um, all of you, so many of you who are into all this, you're really good at giving and giving of yourself, giving to other people, but you're not good at receiving. So these are the things you need to do if you want to learn to love yourself. So you need to learn to say no. You need to stop doing things out of obligation and just to please other people. You need to learn to receive the abundance of the universe. And don't worry about being selfish, and I'll tell you why. Because those of you who are attracted to this kind of work are people who are already extremely selfless and giving of yourself, that in fact, you're getting drained. So what happened with me was that I was always afraid of displeasing people. I was a people pleaser and I would give and give and give of myself. And I would feel guilty if I took, if I received or I did anything for myself. And I continued until the point that I got so drained that I got cancer. And really it was so hard for me to truly put myself first until I got cancer. And this is why I say, love yourself like your life depends on it, because it does. And I share my story because I don't want people to get to the stage where I was before they start loving themselves. It's so important for you to love yourself. Um, so I'm going to actually check out some of the questions that you guys have written. So please continue to post questions. Um, they flash by really fast. And that's Diane Williams working on receiving. Great. And fell back to people pleaser. Thanks for the reboot. Yes, I keep falling back to people pleaser too. Thank you, Sylvie Jorgensen. I love to listen to you. You sound like true. Thank you. I, I love that. Absolutely. I learned the hard way. Yes, see, and even for you, Mary McManus, it took a diagnosis of post polio syndrome for you to awaken. I want you to know that it doesn't take it should not take an illness for you to awaken. For me, it took cancer for me to awaken, but we shouldn't need that. So when I said everything we learn is the opposite of what we need, we learn to give and give of ourselves. We don't learn how to receive. We are told to love other people, but we're not told to love ourselves. We're told to fear illness. We're not told how to feel healthy. We're not told what it means to feel healthy. If you are going, to, yes, Timo Hiltonton says, loving yourself is really hard. Uh, Amy Christine, how do you learn to love yourself? The first thing you do is you start by saying no to what is not you. Loving yourself means being yourself, being who you are. So say no to what is not you. An analogy I use really often is one of Michelangelo when he, um, he, remember he used to carve these beautiful statues of angels. Michelangelo is the famous sculptor and he used to carve these beautiful statues of these beautiful angels. And one day somebody asked him, how do you carve such beautiful statues of angels from just these rocks of marble? And he said, the angel was always there. I just had to chip away until I set the angel free. This is how it is for us. We have to chip away at what is not us. You are always love. You are always whole. You are always complete. You are always beautiful, unflawed, all of it. But you've, ac you've accumulated all this conditioning, beliefs, and layers that have convinced you of all these things that you are not. You have learned to become a doormat and a people pleaser to win other people over, believing that you need them in order to be complete. So the way to really love yourself is to realize you can let go of anything that is not you. You don't have to say yes to everything that's not you. So start by saying no. Start by saying no to everything that is not you. And uh, Maria Anderson asked, how does one know what is me? You know because it feels good. It feels like love. If it feels fearful, if it feels draining, if it feels tiring, it's not you. If it feels energizing, if it recharges your batteries, if it's something you feel you could, you could do over and over and it's, and it's um, charging your batteries as, as opposed to discharging, then it is you. It's you. William Gonzalez 
So when you're frustrated at this point, feel whole, the, um, back to God, get, sorry, the, the comments are going by so fast. Thank you, Laura Ordeal. Love it. How do you separate from a toxic relationship? That's a great question. So you have to strengthen yourself. I always say strengthen yourself. And a quote I use is that don't be afraid to be sensitive. Um, now, I'm going to recommend to you, uh, the one who asked about the toxic relationship, check out Christian Northrup. She's great at when it comes to talking about toxic relationships. She's absolutely great. She's just written a book um, called Dodging Energy Vampires. And that would be very useful for you if you're in a relationship that you feel is a toxic relationship. Um, what I tend to say ab about that is that People who are extremely sensitive, who are extremely empathetic, um, and if you relate to what I'm saying, please mention it in the comments. Let me know that do you feel you're really empathetic? Are you really sensitive? The problem with people like that, people like us, is that we tend to, um, we tend to give and give of ourselves, and we tend to not think about ourselves and we tend to actually always put other people first and the other problem with people like us people who are extremely sensitive is that we are the ones who are attracted to self-help and spirituality now self-help and spiritual teachings tell us constantly to suppress our ego I actually don't agree with that. And that's really, it's, it's something that people argue with me about and it's really controversial. It's really provocative for me to say that. But I don't believe we should suppress our ego. So let me, um, so let me define that a little bit. An ego, our ego makes us more of who we are. This is what I believe. It makes you larger than life of who you already are. And your ego doesn't make you a bad person or a good person. An ego magnifies who you are. So here's what happens. When you are super empathetic, when you're super sensitive, um, you are attracted to spiritual teachings. Spiritual teachers attract a docile audience. They just do. They don't attract the super mega uh, people who are power hungry, greedy, who have huge egos, who are narcissistic, spiritual teachings, um, conscious teachings of conscious awareness, all these things do not attract those type of people. They attract those of you who are empathetic, who are self-aware, who are sensitive, who want to make the planet a better place. They attract people like you. And if you keep squashing your ego and suppressing it and making it small, you will never take on a leadership position to change the world for, to make it a better place. So I always say that the people who I attract, who are attracted to this kind of work, to, who are attracted to Hay House teachings, who are attracted to spiritual teachings, you are all the prime people who need to embrace your egos so that you can take on leadership positions because at the moment we do not have self-aware people. We do not have um, sensitive people, empathetic people, conscious people in leadership positions. We have way too many people who are more interested in their own agendas, who are more narcissistic, um, who, are, who have taken on the leadership positions. So please embrace your ego because it will help you spread who you are with the world. It will help you spread self-awareness. It'll help you spread consciousness. It'll help you spread spiritual teachings throughout the world and make the world a better place. The world needs you to embrace your ego. Um, so that's my take on the ego. And also, let me see, Anita, you told me once on the radio that if you only believe that God loves you, um, this is from Maria Wigomo. 
If you only believe that God loves you, that is the first step in loving yourself. Yes, that was the best advice ever. Thank you, Maria. Um, exactly right, because God loving you and you loving you is one and the same thing. You know why? Because you are an expression of God. Loving yourself and loving God is one and the same thing. You need to know that you are an expression of God. When we die, we leave behind our physical bodies. And when we leave behind our physical bodies, we also leave behind our culture, our religion, our gender, and all our beliefs. And if we leave all of this behind, what is left? What is it that crosses over from this realm into the next? What crosses over is our pure essence, our pure consciousness, pure God, pure love. That's what crosses over. So if you love that essence that expresses itself through you, that is the same as loving God. And if you don't love yourself, it means you don't love God. If you don't love yourself, it means you're not allowing God to express him or herself through you. And you don't have the right to deny God from expressing him or herself through you. That's why it's so important for you to love yourself. When you don't love yourself, you dim your light. You make yourself really small. And by dimming your light, you're not going to, you're not going to brighten anyone else's world. There's no amount of darkness or darkening yourself is going to bring light to anyone else. The only way you can help other people is by first shining your own light. Um, Gervais Wright says, what a coincidence. Oh, it disappeared. I'm so sorry. Um, Anto M, how do you know who you truly are even after endless years of searching? Um, so let's see, I think I answered that, and that would be when you start to feel that you are following your calling. So when you feel that the work you do feels more like a career or a job and you're just paying the bills, then you're not being who you truly are. When you're being who you truly are, you're following your heart, you're following your calling, and you lose the fear, you start to trust in the process of life and you start to lose your fear in the future. You're able to live in the moment. Um, one of the things that I tell people is that, you know, we are all so afraid of the future that we keep thinking about the future. We keep thinking that I need to do this for my future. But actually, you don't even need to worry about your future. All you need to do is make the best choice for this present moment. Choose what brings you the most joy in this present moment. That's the only commitment you need to make. Make a commitment that you will be happy in this present moment, that you will make the choice that brings you joy in this moment. Because if you choose to be happy in this moment and you make that commitment that you're going to do that in every present moment, then you've already created a most beautiful, joyful future. And because the past doesn't exist and the future is made up of a string of present moments. So that's all you have to do. It's as simple as that. Um, I'm checking out some of your questions. William Gonzalez again. So when you're frustrated, disappointed, you feel the whole world has deserted you, go back to God who gave you the first dream. He will free you from depression. Hear me? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you for all the hearts. If I had emojis, I would be waving them up. I would be clicking emojis right back to you. Doris Rumble, question. I think I heard you speak before that we create our own reality after this life. Can we create what we focus on? Can you co comment on that, please? Okay, so here's how we create our life. Now, I don't believe in working too hard to create my life. I actually believe that by loving yourself and by being who you are, you allow what is truly yours to come to you. So you don't have to work really hard at thinking, oh my God, I have to manifest this. I got to work on getting that. I got to chase this. I got to control my thoughts. No, uh, I do it the easy way. I don't control my thoughts. I don't watch my thoughts. I don't fear the fear. I don't fear fearful thoughts. If I have a fearful thought, 
What you do is even if you feel fear, it's human nature to feel fear. Don't suppress it. It's more important to be yourself than it is to be positive. We believe that we need to be positive in order to create a positive reality. Actually, you need to be yourself because when you allow yourself to be yourself, it means you have accepted who you are, all of you. It means you love yourself. And the more you love yourself, the more you attract what is truly yours. And that's what you're here to do. And that's a lot easier than constantly watching your thoughts and filtering your thoughts. Because whenever you are filtering your thoughts and when you are fearing your fearful thoughts, you are actually feeling even more fear and it's making life very difficult and challenging for you. Let me know in the comments if any of you relate to fearing your own thoughts because that's something I always tell people is don't worry about your thoughts. Every time you feel the fearful thought, don't suppress it, don't squash it down, just acknowledge it and say, oh, I'm feeling fear. And then you, all you have to do is just ask yourself, how can I love myself more? What can I do to love myself more? What have I taken on that's not mine? What am I doing that's stressing me out that I can let go of? Because when we don't love ourselves, we're trying to be, we contort ourselves to be everything that other people want us to be. And so the, so the more you love yourself, the more you let go of all those things. Um, Let's take a couple more questions. You're, somebody else has written, I fear my thoughts and O'Callaghan Shida. Yes, I fear my thoughts. Um, yep. See, that's really, really common. And this is why I always say, don't worry about positive thinking because the reason you fear your thoughts is because you believe that your negative thoughts cause a negative reality. And that is actually not true. You don't have to worry your, uh, about your thoughts. When you are having a negative reality or a negative outcome, just sometimes it's just part of your journey. But the thing to do is to love yourself more. Let me tell you a story of what I went through. When I was going through cancer, I believed it was my negative thoughts that caused my cancer. Now, I'm not saying the law of attraction doesn't work, but I think that some of us are missing some of the key elements or the key ingredients of the law of attraction. So I thought my negative thoughts must be causing the cancer. And so I would watch my thoughts. And then I started fearing my thoughts. And the more I feared my thoughts, the more I would fear the fear of fearing my thoughts. And it was so stressful. And I was always trying really hard to control my thoughts, to have positive thoughts. Um, and it just wasn't working. And it was only in death did I realize that I had to embrace all of me. The most, the most important thing I could do was to love and accept myself. And my reality was actually based on how much I loved myself, not on my thoughts. But the more I loved myself, the more I would allow the real me to be channeled through, the more I would allow God to channel itself through me, and the more what was truly mine would come to me. And so in the past, when I thought I was eating healthy, I used, to, um, I used to have wheatgrass juice. I used to eat only organic. Um, I was really paranoid about taking all the supplements because I really wanted to work at getting rid of the cancer. And I was so paranoid every day. I was taking a boatload of supplements every day and I was doing everything I could do and eating what I thought the right foods were, all of it out of the fear of cancer to get rid of the cancer. It was only when I died did I realize that I was missing the most important element, which was love. The only reason to do those things of eating healthy and so on is because you love your life, because you love yourself, you love your body, you want to live long, not from a place of fear. The fear is what actually starts to eat at you and wear you down. That was the one missing ingredient. 
So when I was doing all of this out of fear, I was doing everything, Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine, everything, but I was doing it out of fear. And lay on to that, I felt that um, I had to control my thoughts or I felt it was my karma. I feared everything. And it was only in death did I realize it was none of those things. The only thing that was missing is love, love. That is the solution to every single problem in the world. And it's so unfortunate that in this paradigm that we live in, in this world, in this culture, we're brought up on a diet of fear. And that's why the world is in the mess that it's in. That's why our lives are in the mess that it's in. The only way to turn it around is to exchange the fear for love. It's to transcend the fear by bringing in more love into your life. And the way to bring in more love is to start by loving yourself, by being kinder to yourself, by allowing more abundance into your life, by knowing that you're terrible at receiving and becoming aware and allowing yourself to receive, by practicing a random act of kindness on yourself every day. I don't say practice a random act of kindness to other people because I know you. I know you're already doing it. I know you're being so kind and so good and so giving to other people to the point of draining yourself, but you're forgetting yourself. I want to remind you to practice a random act of kindness on yourself. That's how you can turn it around. And if you want more from me, please check out that interview on the Hay House World Summit or check out my other videos. I have a ton of YouTube vid videos. Come and join me on my Facebook page. Um, check out my books and my website, www.anitamurjani.com. I have a ton of stuff out there. And I know I see a whole lot of other questions. Thank you so much for being part of this. Thank you to the people I haven't got around to answering, Karen Schunk, um, Lori Fulmer, Cynthia M. and Langlois. Thank you so much, all of you, for your comments, for your hearts, for everything. I, um, please check out my videos. I promise you I will be doing a lot more videos. And many of your questions have already been answered in many of my other videos. I'd love to see you around. Um, I'm constantly at speaking at events, so come up and say, hey, love you all. Have a wonderful rest of the day or night, depending on where in the world you are. Thank you again. Bye, and I'll see you all really soon. Thanks. Bye.